out. Let's open our Bibles this morning to the book of Revelation. And, you know, we say we study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and apparently we're not lying. Because here we are. Uh, we're now in Revelation, and we started in Genesis. And then we went through it, and we thought it was so much fun, we did it again. And we thought it was so much fun, we did it again. And it looks like we're about to do it again. So this is our, our third time through the Bible. And uh, Revelation chapter 1. So we're going to just read the whole chapter, so follow along, and, and then we'll uh, come back to verse 1 and, and, uh, and sort of look at it, that first phrase. So, the revelation of Jesus Christ is how it begins. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the word of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he's coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was like the sun, shining in strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Lord, we pray for help now as we come to this part of, of your word and uh, your communication, divinely inspired communication with men. And we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand uh, your purposes in giving us this information. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would charge us, Lord, that we would recognize your power, that we would truly, as your first words here in this letter are the revelation of Jesus Christ, we pray that you would reveal Jesus to us. As we study this letter or this book, we pray that you would open up our hearts to understand you better and your ways. Lord, that we could recognize your spirit and his moving and we could surrender to you, Lord, that we could be doers of the word, not hearers only. We thank you, Lord, that you didn't give us this letter to fascinate us or to disturb us, but you gave this letter to us to reveal Jesus. So reveal Jesus to us, we pray, Lord. May your Holy Spirit take your word and speak to us plainly. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. So 
the book of Revelation uh, begins with a blessing. You'll notice in verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things that are written in it for the time is near. So of, of all the books we've been reading, we believe that reading the Bible is a blessing. So we read the Bible. We do it regularly. And this book, though, is the one that comes uniquely with a stated promise. I guess maybe you could call it a money-back guarantee. If you read the book of Revelation and you're unblessed, you might want to talk to God and say, I'm not blessed, and then he'll, he might talk to you about your cold heart. Uh, you know, I mean, God's, you know, it's good to have back and forth communication with God, you know. Lord, I don't like what you're doing. And he might say, well, I don't like what you're doing and I'm trying to get your attention. And so he'll, he'll speak to you. But remember, when you're reading this, it's not designed to give you nightmares. And it's not designed to make you confused. It's not designed to cause you to become irrational. It's not designed for you to set dates on the return of Jesus or raise money based on those set dates to sell your book by September 23rd because after that, it's not going to be uh, in much demand. Uh, I mean, we've seen all these things happen. It's not, this book wasn't given to us, so we know the 88 reasons why the Lord's coming back in 88, and then the 89 reasons why he's coming back in 89. And then, of course, he gave up after that. Uh, Harold Camping, setting dates. I mean, we have this every year, you know, we get all kinds of new teaching. Uh, it's very important that we, as we go into this study, because it's filled with uh, symbolism. There, there are images that are here. Many times uh, it, it, you'll read the word, and I would encourage you as you're reading to read and read thoughtfully. When you see something and you see the words that we would in English call a simile, you'll see the word as or the word like, they'll actually be within the context or actually stated uh, directly. He's not saying that Jesus' feet here are fine brass. It says it's like. So pay attention when it says that what he sees is like something. You want to note that. And then also note when he's seeing a symbol and, and see if you can think in your own Bible knowledge, has this symbol been used somewhere else in the Bible? Or was this interpreted somewhere else? Or is this interpreted earlier in the book of Revelation? Or is this symbol given to us and then interpreted in the context? A great example is this first chapter. So he says, I turned to see this voice and I saw someone like the Son of Man and he describes him and he sees him standing uh, in the midst of seven golden candlesticks and he sees him with seven stars in his hand. Well, in the context, Jesus actually interprets what those images are. So you actually already, in just the first reading, you already understand something of how to interpret the book of Revelation. If you look at verse 20, the last verse of the chapter, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. Yeah, Jesus, what about that? Well, the lampstands, are lampstands used in a symbolic way other places in the scripture? You guys that know your Bibles. Yeah, actually, yeah. Zechariah chapter four. There's a lampstand that he sees that's directly connected to these olive trees and by these golden pipes and oils flowing from the olive tree directly into the lampstand. That's a really interesting prophecy. It's a very important chapter. It's where we get the words that mean so much to us in Calvary Chapel. Uh, Pastor Chuck, one of the kind of the identifying, uh, uh, I think mo one of the biggest parts of, of the work that God had done in his life that we benefit from was that phrase in Zechariah 4, not by might and not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And they, here's this lampstand, and the lampstand's doing nothing. It's producing light, but there's no human effort involved because there's a direct connection between these olive trees and the oil that's, that is the fuel for the light is just flowing continuously, and light is going, and no one's, no one's harvesting olives, no one's you know, pressing them, no one's refining the oil, no one's hauling the oil in barrels, like in the mob, you know, getting the oil from one place to the other. I mean, there's no human effort involved. The lampstand is lit, connected, oil flowing right to these trees. Awesome. It's not interpreted for us in Zechariah 4. Here we have lampstands used again in a symbolic way in the Bible, and it's actually interpreted for us. You don't have to wonder what those seven stars are. You don't have to wonder what the lampstands are, because look at verse 20. Here's the mystery of it. This is Jesus speaking. He said, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, or the word angel uh, is, the, is the Greek word angelos. We just transliterated into, into uh, English, uh, los angeles, right? Uh, Espanol, it's a transliteration, right, uh, out of Greek. And the, and the word means messenger. 
And it's, this word messenger is used as we think of traditionally angels, like spiritual messengers, spirit beings that are coming, but it's also used of human beings, the messengers. And uh, there, there are passages even in Revelation where John uh, refers to humans that are messengers and also uh, angelic beings that are messengers. So there's, this is written to the meth. So the, the seven stars are the angels or the messengers of the churches. And then the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So if someone comes to you and says, oh, the lampstands are this or the angels are that, you can say, actually, Jesus said they're this. So we've had symbolic language, pretty intense, radical. Jesus shining his glory like the sun shining in its strength. You can't even gaze upon him. It, John falls down like he's dead. It wipes him out. I mean, Jesus' feet glowing, radiating like brass in a furnace, uh, a sharp sword going out. I mean, this is radical. And stars in his hand and lampstands around him. And what is this? Oh, this is crazy. And Jesus tells us what it is. So here's Jesus in all of his glory, a manifestation of his majesty. The messengers are in his hand, and he's in the midst of the, church, the seven churches. Whatever they're going through, he's right in the middle of it. It's not that scary. Right? Read it. Don't be scared of it. Okay? Now, I, I'm just saying that because you're going to be scared in other parts. And uh, we'll get to other parts, and it won't be as clear. And there will be really diverse opinions within, you know, uh, you know mainline, mainstream Christianity. People who believe the Bible uh, have different opinions about a lot of these different things. And so uh, we want to be happy when it's really clear. So be happy. Be blessed. This is a great chapter. We actually have the symbolism interpreted for us. So I wanted to start off this morning by uh, sort of introducing some of these ideas and talking about the very first phrase to sort of give you a baseline as we're going to be studying this book. The very first phrase is the revelation of Jesus Christ. To me, this is the most important phrase in the whole book. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. You, this will help you to filter all of your confusion uh, as you're reading this, you're going to come up with questions, and uh, you'll come to church, and you'll be excited. Maybe you don't usually come to Sunday nights. You know we're going to go through this verse by verse Sunday night. You're going to go, I'm going to come on Sunday night. I want to, man, I got so many questions about this. And you're going to be mad at the end of the Bible study because I didn't answer your question. And you're going to come up after like, hey, I had a question about this. And I'm going to go, yeah, me too. And I go, what did you think? And I go, I have no idea. That's why I didn't bring it up. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to think about that. I don't understand that. So... This book doesn't answer every question. In fact, it will raise questions for you. And you'll say, well, if this, well, what about that? And it doesn't address the thing. You know, you're going to have a lot of follow-up questions that you're going to want to have. And they're not going to be answered for you. You're going to read some things that will be hard to understand. And you're going to wonder about several of the events that are described. Some of them are easy and they bring so much hope, like Revelation 19. We'll read it in a moment. It's just so encouraging to see Jesus coming back in his power and think, yeah, that's how this ends. We know how this thing ends. As, as crazy as this world gets, man, just read the end of the book. Boy, it's nice, to, you know, you know, you're reading, you're living through it. Just go to the end and go, how does this thing turn out? And you read it, oh, yeah, that's right. I know how this thing turns out. And then you go back to the chapter that you're living in, right? Like, you've got financial trials, you've got health trials, you've got difficulties, you've got confusion, you don't know what the future is going to bring. But it's good to be able to read the last chapter. We don't get to read the last chapter of our lives. Well, we do. The last chapter of our lives is right here. You know where you're going. You know how it turns out. You're in that. So, I mean, it's, it's wonderful in that, in that sense. There's some events that bring us so much comfort, but there are other events that are very difficult. There are, you're going to read about the poisoning of the water system of the world. You're going to read about an event that leads to the death of every living creature in the sea. That's hard to imagine because the sea, have you been in the ocean? Do you, do you usually shower pretty soon after you're in the ocean? Do you know why? It's because you're covered with creatures. There are, when you go in the ocean, there are microscopic creatures that live in the ocean. And when you come out, they go with you. Every drop of ocean water that's on you is filled with plant life and animal life. And they're all over you. And then you get out of the water and they die. And you stink, uh, right? It's just, I mean, and then you go, man, I got to get, and like, what's that smell? It's me, oh my goodness, you know. Uh, and, and so you think, all the plankton in the sea? Like, uh, I grew up in Southern California, we had the red tide. It's, a, it's, a, it's an event. 
You know what I mean? By a vet. So, whoa, yeah. You know, I, don't, I can't tell that it's red, but I can smell it. Because there's a certain plankton, they, all, they just die, and then boom. You're like, what? And it's just one kind. What if, I mean, you think, like, what is happening to the world? That you're going to see a, a place called the bottomless pit that's going to open up. There's an angel, some wicked angel that has some power, and he comes out with this horde of demonic spirits that torment people and hurt people. You're going to see a picture of humanity as it degrades and as it embraces Satan and Satan worship. And you're going to see a degradation of humanity that will be appalling. Uh, You know, like we're appalled by Nazism, we're appalled by racism, we're appalled by genocide. There, There are many things about human nature that is appalling to us. It's challenging and it's grievous. And you read the book of Revelation and you watch this stuff unfold and you watch the response of humanity as, it, as this is degrading, some are turning to Christ, certainly, but those that don't, uh, and, and the wickedness of man, it's just, uh, it's just hard to, to take in. So there's a lot of things as you're reading through this that are, you're going to go in all these different directions. This first, that's why I said this first phrase is the most important phrase. Remind yourself that what you're reading is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a revelation of Jesus This book was given to us so that we would see Jesus. It was not given to us to confuse us. God didn't give this to us so that we would not understand what's happening. God gave this to us so that we would understand what was happening and so that we would learn some more things about Jesus. Up until this point, uh, while all the things here that are revealed about Jesus are also revealed in other places in the Scripture, the way they're emphasized here would, would help us to not lose sight of this manifold wonder of the glory of Jesus Christ. He is loving and merciful, and his throne is approachable, but never forget that he sits on a throne, that it is a throne, that he's high and lifted up, and that he's mighty, and that he's a judge. And while he meets the woman caught in adultery and and the very act of it and, and offers her a pardon and extends grace and forgiveness to her, don't forget that at some point there is judgment. There is a judgment coming. And I think that we have to remember, uh, when we think about who Jesus is, we, we can't leave out any of his attributes. And so this isn't given to us to confuse us, but actually to help us to re- remember who Jesus is. This, this is also not given to us to cause us to become fascinated with the Antichrist identity. Some people become super fascinated by end times prophecy. They, they seem to get more into the end times prophecy than they get into Jesus. They seem to be more interested in figuring out who Antichrist is than actually figuring out who the Christ is. So look again at the first phrase. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This isn't the revelation of Antichrist. Now that being said, you'll learn a lot about Antichrist. The word Antichrist, the the word anti, doesn't mean uh, like equal but opposite. It doesn't mean opposer in terms of someone in opposition um, you know, like this is the antidote. Like this, you know, you've got this disease, this is the antidote for the disease. That is, you know, you've got this, but this thing will counteract it, and there's some kind of a thing, battle or whatever. Antichrist has, has the original sort of Latin meaning of the word anti, which means in the place of. He's not equal but opposite. There's no battle between Jesus and the Antichrist. You can, you can read about it, actually, if you don't believe me. It's Revelation 19. But it happens so fast, you'll say, well, wait, where was it? Like, well, yeah, it was there. Like, well, I didn't, I read it. He, the guy's got his armies, Jesus shows up, but then there's not really, yeah, there isn't a battle. It's not a battle. They're, they're not equal but opposite. This is the person who takes this other person's place. That's how you think of Antichrist. Jesus has his place. There's someone, and who he is, he's the person who takes Jesus' place. That's what Antichrist means. That's how you think of it. He's not, he does oppose Jesus, but it's not an opposition in the sense that it's any kind of a competition, any more than if I was going to play LeBron James in basketball. Like, okay, great. Or, you know, we're watching the World Series, right? Like the pitchers are hitting. Like, okay, great, that's an out. I mean, you know, I mean, or maybe freak, you know, somebody hits a hit, but it's like, yeah, okay, you know, it's just one for the year. I mean, it's not a competition. It's, there's not equal but opposite. I think we, it's really important to recognize that. This person is taking the place of Jesus. So remember that when you're reading and you're going through this and you you get really interested in all these different ideas. 
Don't let someone take the place of Jesus. The whole point of this book is so you'll know Jesus. Now, um, it's also not given to us so that we will divide the body of Christ over non-essentials. So my opinion about the rapture of the church, when it happens, does it happen, uh, these are all things that we would say are non-essential. Your, my view of what the Antichrist is, your view of what the Antichrist is, or the Antichrist kingdom, or the seven-year tribulation, or all these different things that are going to be brought before us as we think about end times prophecy, in particular the study of the book of Revelation. None of these are essential. They're not. And so we should treat them like non-essentials, okay? And how do you treat things that are non-essential? You say, well, that's interesting. You know, well, why do you think that? You listen to the person, and you go, oh, that's interesting. I never thought, I don't think of it like that. I think of it like this, oh, okay. And, and we, we agree to disagree. We say, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I don't agree with that. I, I don't see it like that. We don't all have to agree on these things, um, but neither do we want to hold to them so tenaciously that we come with elbow pads, you know, put the mouth guard in. I'm going to church. What's the mouth guard for? We're in Revelation. <laughs> I got to get in there ready because you know, I got to go to church. Well, what'd you put the mouthpiece in for? Because I got to meet that guy. I did some work this week. I was on the speed bag of the internet. Well, what, what, what were you doing? I was loading up, man. What's that for? It's going to church with my revelation gun. Does that happen? Or am I, am I making this up? Or do people argue and get super into this? They do. They totally do. Now, I'm not just saying that for the person who's here who wants to argue with me already, okay? <laughs> Maybe not totally for that person, but <laughs> listen, I, I've been a pastor long enough. I've taught on this many, many times. It seems like we always have a visitor that comes on one of these days, and they come up, blah, 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 and like, okay, bye, crazy guy, <laughs> you know? Listen, we're, we're not interested in making something that's not the issue the issue because this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. There are some things that are essential. You know what's essential? Who is Jesus? <laughs> what did he do? What is he going to do? You know, how do I get right with God? Uh, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through him. There are some essentials, and there are, they are worth dividing over, right? There are some things... The identity of Jesus is worth dividing over. He's not the Son of God. He's not God come in the flesh. He's not really a human being. Hey, hey, wait a minute. That's, that's something, that's an essential. So there are essentials, and then there are non-essentials, and it's really important when we come to the book of Revelation, it's really easy to get super interested in things that are non-essential. So remind yourself when you're reading and you get excited about a non-essential that you're actually getting excited, excited about something that's non-essential. Okay? Um, which, by the way, I'm really glad that we're, we're not sending toothpaste and candy uh, in that announcement. I, I don't know if you guys caught that, but I did. I, uh, like, I'm glad she did it in that order. We're not sending toothpaste, but bring your candy. Uh, for those of you that are listening, uh, you missed the announcements. I mean, it's just on a recording, but it was funny. I thought, uh, yeah, I'm bringing candy. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm like a a Sherpa of candy when I travel. So I, I, I'm at, we're going to be in, in uh, one of the countries that you're not supposed to preach the gospel um, and, uh, and with some friends who are preaching the gospel and, and I'm bringing their kids candy. But I hadn't thought about toothpaste. So just kind of kind of hit home. Now you say, well, why did you veer off into that? That's a non-essential. Right? It's a non-essential. It's like, I can't believe that. This is the kind of toothpaste. If you're going to not send toothpaste, this is the kind you don't send. People will argue and fight over anything. Don't just remember when you're reading this, slip back and just your starting point is this is a revelation of Jesus. And when you find yourself becoming so excited about something that's, that's not about Jesus, like it's okay. It's, in the, it's here. It's, God gave it to us. It's okay to think about it. But remember, it's not essential, Right? There are things that are essential, or discern, is this an essential? Is this really pointing me back to Jesus? So that's important. This, this is actually given to us to show us Jesus. So focus on the things that reveal Jesus. And when you're in a passage that might be more difficult, as you're sort of trying, and you're reading, and you're wanting to understand it, ask yourself the question, 
well, why, did, why is God telling us this part? Why is he letting us in on this? And, and, and what is it that I'm learning about Jesus as these evil spirits are being released and they're coming out and tormenting people? How, what is this showing me about Jesus? It's a revelation of Jesus. So ask yourself, what, what, am I, what can I learn about Jesus? Jesus is amazing. He's our Savior and he's our Lord. He's the person that we're focused on. So we want to make sure that as we're studying the book of Revelation, we remember that it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. You'll hear, even hear people when they refer to this say, well, I was reading Revelations the other day. Uh, Revelations, plural. right? Have you, maybe you've said that. I, I was reading Revelations, man. Well, look again at the first phrase. It's not Revelations, plural. It's Revelation, singular. Because it's a singular revelation about a unique person, Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So... That's very, very important. It can't be overemphasized. We'll try to remind ourselves as we go through. So why do we need this revelation of Jesus Christ? I was part of a church when I got saved and when I was uh, first learning the ministry. Man, I don't think we offered a a study in the book of Revelation in the Bible college I went to. Um, I I studied Romans. In my upper division classes, I'm thinking of what classes I had. Galatians, 1 Corinthians, Romans. uh, I think I had uh, Peter's epistles. Um, But I don't believe that in the four and a half years I was at the university that they offered revelation as a class. (laughs) That's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't touch that thing. Uh, That that book. I mean, because if we read it, we're going to be divided. If we read it, we're going to have nightmares. If we read it, we might become possessed. I don't know, like it's a weird book. It's out of control. Why do we need this book? Why did God give it to us? I mean, it seems like the emphasis in chapter one, is God gave this to Jesus to give to his angel, to give to John, so John could give it to the church, so the church would know the things that are going to come to pass. I mean, it seems like God's into it. It seems like Jesus is into it. So, so um, why do we need it? Some parts of the church are, are afraid of it um, and, and uh, you know, not wanting to, to spend time going through it. Why do we need it? I want to I talk about a spiritual reason first. Well, primarily, um, all my reasons are spiritual, but, but especially this is uniquely spiritual, is that Satan blinds people. Satan, in particular with unbelievers, he blinds unbelievers. Satan does not play fair. Uh, God will respect your free will. Satan has no respect for your free will. He will dupe you. He will lie to you. He will trip you up. He will make something seem like it isn't. God won't do that to you. He's not going to lie to you or trip you up or go, they don't want to go to heaven, but watch this. I'm going to trick them into heaven. Uh, you know, hey, right here, here's where Satan's worship at. Come and talk with us, brah. And then all oh, you get into this church. Aha, you're stuck in heaven forever. And all you want to do is get high. No, God doesn't do that. But listen, what, you know what the devil does? He'll lie to you the whole way. Here's how to have fun. Come over here. This is awesome. You want to be free? Come over here and put these shackles on. You want to be free? Come hook yourself with this barbed hook right up here in your jaw. We'll get it in there deep. It's awesome. You know, he, he traps people. He lies to people. Turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'll remind you of this uh, warning from the Apostle Paul about the, the devil's ministry to unbelievers. In verses 3 and 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, he said, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. And then look at verse 4. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God, should shine on them. There's some way where Satan works on people who are unbelievers. And so if you're here today and you're an unbeliever and you're excited at the end of the service that you managed to survive the service and maintain your unbelieving status, so yeah, he's preaching the gospel again. I'm not raising my I'm not going to go for it. I'm not responding. I'm not going to pray. Well, you've managed to continue to be deceived. God wants to shine the glory of the gospel of Jesus, the message of what God has done for us in his son, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the dead, a unique person in history on a particular day who was God and man, and the death that he died, he died to atone for sin, to pay 
the penalty for sin. One person for everybody. And Jesus did that. It's been done. And you can receive forgiveness for all your sins by putting your trust in what Jesus did. You can be saved. You can be born again. The Spirit of God will come and live in your heart. You can have a new life. Some people hear that message and they go, that doesn't make any sense. I don't even believe that or whatever. And, and Paul's telling us that to some people it's like veiled. They can't see. And he tells us the reason why is that the God of this world has blinded people. He's blinded them. He's distracting them. He's making them think this is more important. He puts his hand in front of their eyes. He's, he's shading it. He's, he maybe gave them a terrible experience in a church as a young person, or they, they saw a bunch of hypocritical things, and, they, and now it's sort of like, ah, I don't want anything to do with that. This, this is just so much corruption. And they just turn away. and Like, well, listen, that wasn't Jesus. That was man. And that's a sign you need Jesus. I mean, I mean everybody fails. We need a Savior. Um, his best hope is to not let people even see Jesus. Satan's best tactic is to not let people see Jesus. Why? Because if you see Jesus, how do you not fall in love with him? I love you. Well, I don't love you. I still love you. Well, what kind of, what is this? It's called unconditional love. There's no such thing. There is, actually. You've never seen it in anybody else because everybody else is corrupt, but I love you unconditionally. Well, what, what are these holes? These are holes that I bore nails when I was hung on a cross for you. Oh, I never believe. I don't even care. I know, but I still die for you. I mean, unconditional love, the mercy of God, the love of God, the patience of God extended in Jesus. So no wonder Satan says, I'm not going to let you see Jesus. I'm going to put a curtain over him, and then I'm going to put in front a false, fake Jesus. He's the church, blah, blah, blah. He's over here. You know, he's all about money. He's word, faith. He, you know, whatever, you know, some fake imposter. He'll blind the minds of unbelievers. And... That's his work with unbelievers. He has a work with believers. He, he seeks to distract and confuse believers. He wants believers to think of Jesus as being their buddy or their bro, but not their God and their judge or their Lord. Remember, Jesus talked about a people that would be on the day of judgment who would be shocked, and he's going to say, uh, I don't know you. And they're going to say, wait a minute, I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons in your name. I did mighty miracles in your name. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I don't know you. You say, whoa, whoa, wait, what is that? Yeah, exactly. What is that? Someone who didn't know Jesus, who was deceived. They were working iniquity. They were living in sin. But because they had some pseudo attractions as part of their life that were Obviously, fake. They weren't real, uh, but they maybe appeared real. They were deceived. And Jesus said, many are going to say to me on that day. That's a heavy, it's a heavy warning. Satan would want to distract and confuse believers. The Bible calls him a deceiver. Satan is a deceiver. What does it mean to deceive somebody? Have you ever been deceived? Have you ever, uh, uh, you know, been in a situation where you, you, I, I was thinking of a, uh, you know, people false advertising, you go to the window, I was thinking of uh, changing money, and I've, I've had this happen to me so many times, you go, you're in another country, you go to change money, and they advertise the rate, and then, you know, you get your money back, and it's not the same, and you think, I can ma- multiply, and I kind of had an idea what I was going to get, and you well, wait a minute, this isn't, all the money's not here, and they go, oh, there's a fee. Uh, well, that's a big fee, like you took like 8%, like that's a lot of money. You know, like, well, no. Well, you didn't advertise the fee. You told me this was the rate. That looks like a decent rate. Yeah, but, you know, and then you're holding the fake monopoly money, and they got the real money, right? That's an ethnocentric American comment, right? So they feel like that when we rip them off. So it's, it's fair. Uh, you know, I got this money, and, and like, well, wait, 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 wait. That, yeah, that's what the devil does, right? He's a, de- he, he's a deceiver. It presents like, hey, this is it. And then you step in and you think, well, wait, this wasn't it. Yeah, oh, there's a fee. Oh, it's a fee. And you lose something so valuable. I mean, that's the devil. He's a liar. He never tells the truth. And he loves to tell lies that are mostly true. So when you're listening, you're like, oh, I can, I'm going to listen carefully to this. Oh, that's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah, that's probably all true. And then you didn't really pay attention all the way through because it's 98% true but 2% false, then the 2% that's false undermines the whole other 90% that was true. 
And he mostly seeks to distract and confuse us about the nature of God. I've met many, many Christians who have a faulty view of the nature of God, especially in our country where we're so attacked by the enemy by, from materialism. You know what chokes out the word? What did Jesus warn us chokes out the word? The seeds planted on the soil and then there's weeds. He said the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. Is there a culture on the planet that has been more attacked than our culture by those three things? We have the ability, we have such prosperity materially that we're, we're especially susceptible to having the word of God be choked out in our lives because the cares of the world. Well, who has the cares of the world like the Americans? Who consumes, like, it, who, whose antidepressant market for drugs is like our market? Nobody's in the whole world. Nobody's as depressed as we are. I mean, nobody goes to the doctor and the doctor's like, look, you need this. My friends that live in three third world countries that would, they, they think, man, if I could just go to America. And I tell them, man, we're so depressed. If you came here, you'd be on drugs. We're legalizing marijuana because we need to get high. You go to our liquor stores, man, we're selling so much alcohol. We're, we're just, we're, we have to be under the influence. That's how depressed we are. Oh, no way. If I could just be there, I would never be. No. Why? What is it? It's materialism. It's a lie. And even believers, we, you know, we, we make our life something about something that's not even about that. This book, man, it's a tune-up. <laughs> Especially chapter 2 and 3. Jesus, did you read it? Have you been reading through this? Jesus has some pretty intense things to say to the churches. It's like he's Lord of the church. I mean, it's like he has an opinion, and it's like his opinion is the only one that matters. You know, in, our, in America, because we've become such a consumer culture, we have this so consumer mindset, that actually people come to church like consumers. Oh, I, I didn't really like that service. Uh, you know, the person, no one smiled at me. Uh, I give it a three-star rating. <laughs> Listen, does your opinion matter? Absolutely. Do we care about you? Of course. Do we want someone to be nice to you? Yes. If you're here and you're mean, stop it. Be nice to people, okay? But that kind of, like, like <laughs> but is there something corrupt about that? Absolutely. You know whose opinion matters about our church? Now think about before you answer it. Because there's a Sunday school answer that the kids know to blurt out, Jesus, God, the Bible. One of those is going to be right for every question the Sunday school teacher asks. <laughs> Jesus, God, the Bible. Like, uh, before you blurt out the churchy answer, do you really believe that? Be careful before you say you do, because God might have an opinion about how you're acting. Because if God's opinion is the only opinion that, ma that matters about the church, then what's his opinion about me? And what does he have to say about me and how I'm, what I'm doing and how I'm treating people? I mean, if, if his opinion really is the one that primarily matters, more important than any other, now all of our opinion matters, obviously, so don't, don't misunderstand the point. But if his is the one that primarily matters, what are the implications of that? His, he has a strong opinion about this. See, Satan would want to have us deceived about Jesus and his mercy, Jesus and his patience, Jesus and his love. That's all true. That's part. That's, that's a foundation. That's what we understand about him. His mercy is new every morning. There's a reason why his mercy is new every morning. Because we need it every morning. And if, if I live in the idea that I don't need it every morning, then I, I'm going to get a warped and strange view of who God is. And the book of Revelation it gives us an emphasis on the nature of Jesus that's important for us. Satan wants to distract and confuse us about the nature and character of God. And even our circumstances, and this is the part that might not be entirely spiritual. I think our own hearts deal with this, or the devil will try to use circumstances. But circumstances can tend to make us forget certain things. Um, we are in this uh, time period where we're just over we're just overrun with information. I mean, you, can, you can't just turn on your phone and your phone is just telling you things you don't even want to know. Like, I need to figure out how to turn off notifications. Um, you know, because, you know, you update and then all of a sudden someone's like, I don't need to know this. Like, don't just automatically think that, you know, just Satan, you know, get behind me. The thing will just tell me, like, hey, blah, blah, blah. Like, hey, 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 stop. Where's the button? I get it. You know, it'll, 
Here's another, like, blah, 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 the BBC, like, send me. And I, I, click, I have your app. I don't want you to just interrupt me, though. Uh, I want to pray before I look at the news site. Lord, I'm going in. Please, you know, help me. I'm going to try to, like, see what's happening in the world. I'm going in. Like, all right, you're in control. You're the one who's Lord over all. You're king of kings. You're the one who opens and no one shuts and shut. These are all things that we see in this letter, right? He says, I got the keys of hell and death. I open and no one shuts, and I shut and no one opens. I'm going to bring the kingdom of David. I'm a ruler over the kings of the earth. These are all things in this letter. We need to remember that because the circumstances can cause us to panic. The circumstances can cause the believers to act like unbelievers. The, the circumstances can cause the believers to act like the earth is our home and that the kingdom that we're primarily interested in is an earthly kingdom. Now, do I, I care about my home? Yes. Do I love my country? Absolutely. Do I think it's worth fighting for? Yes. I mean, I, I, I value our values. I love our constitution. I love our ideals. Do we fall far short of them? Yeah, but that's why we have ideals, so we can regroup and dialogue and get back. Okay, well, how do we fix this? Because this is what we really believe, even if we don't act like it. Let's change our behavior and do this. So I'm, I believe that. But this earth is not my home. At all, not at all. Everything here is going to burn. Everything I have is going to burn. The people who tragically lost their homes in Santa Rosa or Napa or those, the hills up there in uh, Sonoma County, all that tr tragic devastation, there's a reality that all of our lives pass through the holy fire of God and only what's eternal is what's left over. Jesus said, lay up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't corrupt, where thieves don't break in and steal. So circumstances might make us forget who God is, and there could be a hopelessness that comes to us from world events. Now, the believers that he's writing to at the end of the first century is that, I mean, where is John when he writes this? We read it. What's the, the physical setting, the physical circumstances of John are he's in exile on the island of Patmos. You can actually go to Patmos today and do a tour. It doesn't take very long. I've never been there, but a group from our church went. Joe Dutra took the high school kids to Greece, and they went to Patmos. And he said, we pretty much are sure if John was living in the cave, we know which one it is. Really? How do you know? Because there's one cave. <laughs> I mean, it's like if you go to Alcatraz or something, you know, like, it's a rock. There it is. It's there. You can see it. You walk around it. You're like, okay, well, there it is. It's not, it's not like this expansive, you go around and there's all kinds. Of, I mean, this dude, is, he's the apostle John who leaned on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. And now, according to church history, his eyes have been gouged out. He's been put in exile. He's on the island of Patmos. I mean, it, that's, those are bad circumstances. And he gets a revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, all of a sudden, you read the book of Revelation, your circumstances on the island, like, I got it pretty good. You guys got it pretty bad. You might want to write Caesar a letter and go, hey, Caesar, dude, I just was, I just was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and this is what I saw, and this is what I heard. You're going to want to repent. But you're a blind, elderly man, you know, on a desert island. You got nothing. Your people have nothing. We're going to exterminate Christianity. Actually, you're not. You're going to need to repent. Uh, all the rich men are going to cry for the mountains to fall on them and save them from the wrath of the Lamb. Circumstances might make you forget. And do we have challenging circumstances? Absolutely. And that's what's important about uh, the book of Revelation. It reminds us of the total victory of God. And so what's revealed about Jesus in this book? Well, he's glorious. We see that here in chapter 1. We've studied the New Testament, and we see Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're coming to the Christmas season, and there's a revelation of Jesus at Christmas, and Jesus comes how? As a baby. He comes as a servant. We see him laying down his life. We see him humble. We see him mistreated. We see him gracious. You read the book of Revelation... And you realize, man, I'm really glad he came that first time because <laughs> he's also a judge. They're not mutually exclusive identities. It's not like this is the identity of Jesus and this is his other identity. This is Jesus. This is who he is. He's glorious. When John sees him, he hears a voice that sounds like a flood, like a waterfall, like, uh, like a trumpet. Now, what in the world does that mean? Have you been to Feather Falls when it's just pumped? I mean, we just had a great winter, right? And a lot of water. Did you go to Yosemite? You hear the roar of the waterfall. Isn't it amazing? What does it sound like? I mean, it's just, it's just the power of all that mass just moving. And, 
And, it, and it's awesome. And so John says, that's what his voice was kind of like. It's like that. Like, what do you mean? It's like, not like anybody's voice you ever heard. It was like the atmosphere, like, like power, and like a trumpet. His voice was like a trumpet. Now, what in the world does that mean? It doesn't say his voice was a trumpet like he spoke to you. His voice, well, a trumpet, this, a brass instrument projecting this clear tone, just powerful. Listen, if, don't do it, but if one of you were, had your trumpet with you and you blew it right now, we wouldn't like it. Because you might, a person could blow a trumpet in this room and we would probably have to plug our ears, wouldn't we? And if, if they were skilled and good and just hit a note, you're just like, okay, bro, yeah, you're good. I mean, you could really blare. It, it, it's a power, a clarity, a beauty, a majesty. That's his voice. John hears it behind him and he's like, I heard a voice behind me, like a voice I never, ever heard. Do you like the sound of Trump's voice? I mean, the guys mimic it or whatever. It's a pretty easy voice to mimic. Because it's very distinctive. Did you like Obama's voice? It's kind of a distinctive voice. It's a human voice. Uh, George Bush, these guys mimic. Do you think on Saturday Night Live they're going to mimic the voice that sounds like many waters and like a trumpet? I don't think the comics can mimic him. I don't think there's satire when the one whose countenance shines like the sun in its strength and his voice is like the sound of many waters. And John said, I heard that voice and I turned and looked. And he said his countenance, well, it was like the sun, like we can't, you can't look at the sun. It's too mighty. And so John falls down like he's dead. Verse 17, I fell at his feet as though I were dead. John knew Jesus. He was one of Jesus. He refers to himself in the gospel of John as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He leaned on the chest of Jesus, reclining around the table at the Last Supper. He's leaning on Jesus' chest. He knows Jesus you could say John knows Jesus as, and as intimate or close with Jesus as any of the disciples of Jesus ever have been. He's now an old man. He's been walking with Jesus for decades and decades and filled with the Spirit, Jesus' representative. And when he sees Jesus in his glory, he just collapses. That's radical. Do you know Jesus? Yeah. Is he your Savior? Yeah. Do you love him? Yeah. Do you know you're, do you think you're, you're him revealing himself to you in his glory? You'd have a different response? I mean, we, be, we want to be thoughtful about the nature of Jesus. He's glorious. He has authority over his church, and he exercises it. That's chapters 2 and 3. You can read through those. We'll get into them in the coming weeks. Um, boy, he has a strong opinion. When you read chapter 2 and 3, tell me, or maybe if you're an underliner in your Bible, underline what sounds like a threat. Does it sound like he threatens his church? A couple of times he said, look it, you got a name that you're alive, you're dead. I'm coming, I'm taking away the candlestick. What's a candlestick? It's a church. What's going to happen? <laughs> I'm taking it away. There's not going to be any churches there. I'm gonna, you, you listen and take it seriously or you don't. I mean, you think, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is he, is he like that? Yeah, <laughs> apparently. It's a revelation of Jesus. He cares. He has authority. He exercises it. We just got to this passage in Matthew 16 last week. Jesus said, on this rock I will build whose church? My church, his idea, his plan, his organization. Who's head of the church? The Pope. Everyone knows that. Or the pastor, he's head. Or the board of elders, they're the head. Who's the head of the church? Jesus. <laughs> he's a, he has authority. What's revealed about him? His glory, his authority over the church. And what about the rest of the book of wrath, of, of wrath the book of Revelation? <laughs> He's the judge and there's wrath. Now, that's, this is really important about Jesus. Some people have constructed a Jesus, they're Christians, and their view of Jesus is he is not capable of wrath. And that's not true. In the great statement about the gospel, in, Revel, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, a lot of you have it memorized, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, for it is the power of God unto salvation, right? Verse 17, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. Verse 18 says what? What's verse 18 about? He says, for the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and all ungodliness. Paul's talking about the gospel. He talks immediately about the wrath of God. Why do we need the gospel? Because the wrath of God is going to be revealed against ungodliness. Is God patient? Yes, thank God. But 
the reason we're excited about his patience is because we're going to be under the wrath of God if we don't respond to his patience. We don't want to fall into the trap of like, well, no, there is no wrath. There's wrath. And there's a great phrase in Revelation 6, 16 and 17. We're coming to the the close here. Revelation 6, 16 and 17 is this wrath. The seals are open of this scroll and the wrath of God's being poured out. And all these men, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, everybody, there's no one escapes this. They hide in caves and rocks. And verse 16, they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us. And I think this is so interesting. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. What an interesting mixed metaphor. The wrath of the Lamb. Oh, I'm pretty sure I could handle that. Oh, that ram is wrathful. I mean, the wrath of a lion? Okay. I'm cool. <laughs> All right, I'll stay out of the cage. The wrath of the Lamb. Don't get in there. Okay. Well, I'll take him on. The wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb. Is your Lamb of God? capable of wrath, the wrath of the Lamb. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Because there's wrath, wrath of God against sin. He's the judge. That's what we see uh, revealed for us at the end of the book of Revelation. There's a throne that's set up. There's a judgment, and the escape of judgment comes because of Jesus. If your name's in the book of life, you escape judgment. If your name's not in the book of life, you're judged, and you go into a lake of fire where the devil goes and his angels. Human beings are not supposed to go there, but we joined the rebellion against God. We, we gave ourselves over to sin, and we're under the penalty of sin, which is death, and there's the second death, which is the lake of fire, and the only way out of that is by receiving Jesus Christ, having your name in the Lamb's book of life. So these are all revealed here. So two closing questions. Why is this important? Why is this important? Well, I think we already talked about it a little bit. One is so we wouldn't be deceived. The devil would want to deceive us. Two, I think circumstances. We want to make sure that when we're reading about the North Koreans and the things they might do and you see the Iranians might do this and you, you know, what's going to happen with this and Putin is doing this and oh my goodness, the Chinese are building a pipe and they're just connecting themselves with Europe and oh my, you know, what is happening? And uh, man, read this book. Your circumstances might cause you to forget what's really happening. God's in control, and he knows, and he's told us. So we don't want to be deceived about the nature of God. We don't want our circumstances to get to the best, get the best of us. But I would say primarily, as it's a revelation of Jesus, we need to remember uh, his unique nature. There's no one like him. Our judge is our Savior. Our Savior is our judge. Uh, there's, there is a person who is so uh, beyond compare, but he's the person who also came in human flesh and walked among us. And, and, and we don't want to give up any aspect of his nature. Uh, we, we want to hold them all and believe in them and trust in him. And so what do I do about that? When you read the book of Revelation, one of the ways that you'll get blessed reading it is that it will make you think of the holiness of God. Uh, everyone who has this hope that the return of Jesus purifies himself. There's a purifying effect when you think about the return of Jesus and the establishment of his kingdom and him as king. It purifies. Why? Because it's so easy for us to compromise. It's so easy for us to say, well, God, just, he's so forgiving. He's just going to forgive me. I'm just going to do this. Or I'm going to keep doing it. How many believers are continuing in sin and just forgetting about the reality that look, Jesus is holding the messengers in his hand. He's in the midst of the candlesticks, and he has an opinion. And so we, we need to allow Jesus to really be our Lord, be the Lord of our lives, to let him save us from our sins, truly save us from our sins, not save us from the penalty so we can keep living in sin. If you're here and you have a struggle with sin, well, that's everybody, okay? So I just addressed everyone in the room. Everybody's here and has a struggle with sin. The identity of Jesus is how you win. He's the victor. He's the captain of our salvation. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the one with whom we have to do. And our best way going forward is by thinking of who he is and remembering who he is and realizing he doesn't, he's not making any treaties with sin. He's not, his patience doesn't take away from his justice. Neither does his justice mean he's not patient. He's both. This is how we're saved and this is how we're saved. Uh, It's very important. A church that loses 
a sense of the soon return of Jesus is going to lose its holiness. And the, and the best way to have true holiness is to focus on Jesus. A church that focuses on holiness is going to become weird and have weird shoes and weird haircuts and wear weird clothes and have weird... I mean, it's going to... If you focus on holiness, you're going to get weird. If you focus on Jesus, truly focus on Jesus, then you can't help but become holy because he's holy. And we don't, we don't want to have a selective Jesus. We only know, that, uh, this is the only things I believe about him. No, I believe everything about him. This is, who, this is a revelation of Jesus. He's awesome. The one who died for me is this guy. You know, Christmas emasculates him. I mean, people love Jesus at Christmas because he's a harmless baby. You know, and we just get presents. Well, yeah, he was a harmless baby whose, whose countenance is like the sun shining in his strength. Man, out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. You know that harmless baby? He's coming back. He's going to open a scroll. Wrath of God's going to be poured out. People are going to cry. The most powerful people on the earth are going to be begging him, begging for deliverance from his power, that helpless baby. Yeah, Christmas is a revelation of Jesus. So is the revelation of Jesus <laughs> in the Bible. Read that on Christmas. Hey, I got a Christmas story for you guys. <laughs> Invite your family over. <laughs> Takes about an hour to read through the book of Revelation. I mean, just take about an hour before we open presents. You know, I thought it'd be kind of cool to think about, you know, Christmas is Jesus. Let me read. Let's read the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whoo! That'd be a great Christmas, wouldn't it? Best Christmas present. Why, why, would, why are we laughing? And thinking, well, because people have a miss perception of his identity, a deceived and confused and distorted misperception. So Father, help us. Help us as we begin this time as a fellowship, studying through your word, and we pray for insight in your word. I pray for all of us as we're reading through the week and thinking about these things that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. We thank you for the purifying effect, Lord, of of your identity, you as judge, you as the coming king, Lord, you putting down all of your enemies and you making a new heavens and a new earth and the old heaven and the old earth gone forever. And how awesome to think, Lord, of your victory and how we trust in it and hope for it, but Lord, how we need it to impact our lives practically. So Lord, purify us, purify us, help us to walk with you, help us to to live in the fear of God and to think of you properly, Lord, and, and to not make light of sin and trust in your mercy to the neglect of your holiness. Lord, we want to be balanced, so help us. Lord, you know how this applies to all of our lives. Lord, we don't want, we know you don't, you didn't come to condemn, you came to save. So Lord, let us not fall into that condemnation, but Lord, let us step out of the darkness into the light. However, we need to um, let your spirit clean house, Lord, clean house in our hearts. We pray, Lord, that your word would be transformative and cleansing to us as we study it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.